COVID lockdown lifting sooner than we thought. The PM's promise of an early mark tonight. The first signs of normal life return to New South Wales. What's coming next? A resident's final days inside Penrith's infected nursing home. Exclusive details as the death toll rises. A month stuck in hotel quarantine. The couple locked in with Ruby Princess crew who are tonight speaking out. Harbour raid. The new threat at sea is Border Force team storm a yacht. Sideways and screaming, a driver's terrifying ride stuck on a truck. And NRL deal, players take a pay cut, but the Warriors remain the roadblock. Live from Sydney, 7 News with Michael Usher. Good evening. Tonight, in fact, right about now, we really take a step toward life as we knew it six weeks ago. The relaxing of social restrictions. And that means in moderation, we can fire off the barbecue and catch up over the kitchen bench with a small number of family and friends. Reward after good results and responsible actions. Fewer than 700 cases are still active, with just over 100 in hospital. Opening the gate back into part of our old lives. How are you? Good. Kate and Claire welcome their friend Kerry into their home. A cup of tea, a chat, human connection, life's simple pleasures. To actually sit down and have a cup of tea is pretty nice to, to look somebody in the eye and have, and have a conversation. From today, up to two adults and their children can visit another household anywhere in New South Wales. When you visit, practice social distancing, maintain hygiene and don't go if you or they are unwell. We ask you to do that with caution and especially if you're with vulnerable people, people of a certain age. The catch-ups are restricted to homes. The two-person limit still applies in public places. And please make sure you follow those, those uh, rules. Spas and beauty salons were given the green light to open their doors, but only to sell products. Just Cut's hairdressers have begun a staged reopening. It's a matter of getting supplies like hand sanitizer and things like that. Hoping the coronavirus crisis can be cut short. To keep moving ahead, testing has to be a priority. The government is pushing for 8,000 tests to be done each day, urging anyone, even with mild symptoms, to come forward. In an Australian first, New South Wales results have been broken down by postcode available in these heat maps, alerting the public to active cases in their suburbs, like Bondi with 112, Mossman with 41, and Cadence, home to the New March House cluster, with 49. Miley Hogan joins us now from Piermont. Miley, good evening. Do these relaxed restrictions mean we can now go wherever we like? Good evening, Michael. No, not at all. Visiting friends and family have simply been added to the list of reasonable excuses for being outside your home, and those include other things like work, education, exercise, uh, legal and medical appointments. This change does not mean that you can just go for an aimless drive into the country, go camping or have a picnic at the beach. Police will still be checking on people uh, who are outside of their home without a reasonable excuse, and they are still giving out $1,000 fines. In fact, 14 have been handed out in the last 24 hours, Michael. Molly Hogan, thank you. A relative of one of the 13 dead at Newmarch House claims he had no contact in person with doctors in the days before he died. It comes as authorities admit they're baffled as to how more staff and residents have become infected at that facility. Anne Fay, one of three residents whose positive test was confirmed yesterday. 76 years old, living in a wing of Newmarch House that was, until recently, COVID-19 free. She has not been out of that room of isolation. She hasn't been out of there for weeks. Her granddaughter demanding to know how coronavirus is still spreading three weeks after the outbreak began. We lost for words. Health authorities admit they don't know. Whether it will be um, the staff that have infected the patients or whether there's something else that we're missing. The facility's 13th death was confirmed this morning. A 74-year-old man. I can't imagine what it would be like being a family member of a resident. A relative of one victim is upset medics didn't visit him in person after diagnosis. From the day of his positive result to his death, no doctor saw him, his message reads. Anglicare says he was attended to via video link instead and family were informed. Also, during their final video call together, the man says the look of horror and panic in his eyes was terrifying. You have to think they're sitting ducks in there now. There are now calls to separate the infected residents here from the rest, either putting them all in hospital or quarantining the uninfected somewhere else.
Experts say aged care staff aren't trained to cope with the coronavirus crisis. This is like asking a suburban football team to step up to play in the major league. It's just not the same thing. The situation must change because the strategy that New South Wales Health has right now is not working. The trouble is, though, many residents don't want to leave, and Faye among them. Her family told today she has just a 40% chance of survival. Anyone who tested negative, it would have been ideal if they could all come out weeks ago. Alex Hart, 7 News. We all love an early mark and Australia is set to begin its national relaxation of virus restrictions late next week. The Prime Minister and Premiers have decided to bring forward the first major step in reopening the country but have warned Australians will have to meet key milestones first. The virtual leaders meeting that ordered Australia indoors now prepares to gently reopen the country beginning within days. Australians have earned an early mark through the work that they have done. National Cabinet has brought forward to next Friday its planned meeting to start easing Australia's restrictions. No announcements today on which of the closed sectors will lead. Instead, a warning. Cabinet will stall the reopening if millions more Australians don't download its COVID Safe app. Download the COVID Safe app. Download the app today. Download the COVID Safe app. Downloading the app. Download it. In the sector where the virus is deadliest, the leaders have backed an aged care code of conduct, rights for relatives to visit their loved ones. It will keep those who are in aged care facilities safer. And $205 million in new assistance to centres, $900 per resident, $1350 for those in regional Australia. This will contribute towards the genuine extra costs that they are incurring. Next Friday's meeting on restrictions comes with the economy all but screaming for relief. The number of Australians on unemployment benefits has crossed one and a half million. Almost one million have applied for access to their super. We can't keep Australia under the doona. How far have we crawled under the doona? The government points to data from Apple, a slump in our demand for driving directions, and from Google, a jump in our time spent at home. Google does track people. The COVID Safe app doesn't. Tim Lester, 7 News. A couple held in hotel quarantine longer than any other in Australia say they had to beg New South Wales health officials to swab them before testing positive. They're now locked in the same hotel as infected members of the Ruby Princess crew, as one of the ship's waiters speaks exclusively to 7 News. As you enjoy the winding down of Sydney's lockdown laws today, <laughs> spare a thought for Jack and Carly. Here is like our TV. We have like a little living room situation. Confined to quarantine hotels for 33 days. We entered hotel quarantine on the very first day it was introduced. So, and we're still here. After a trekking holiday through South America, they returned March 29, straight into two weeks hotel quarantine. But just as it was ending... I looked up the coronavirus symptoms and I had everything. I was ticking all the boxes. But Carly claims health authorities not only refused to test them, they were happy for them to leave. And the nurses said they didn't think I needed to be because I was already negative. She fought for tests, which came back positive. Now it's their relationship being tested. I've already told him, I don't think I want to get married, sweetie. Don't propose to me. <laughs> New South Wales Health wouldn't comment on their initial reluctance to perform those tests, but in a statement they did reveal when two people decide to quarantine together, it can take longer to recover. Sharing the complex, the 33 infected Ruby Princess crew. And for the first time today, one has spoken out. Angry, they've been vilified. Yes, of course. We don't know whether we got this one because... Our enemy is uh, the, the virus. We cannot see it. He says the crew faced problems. He ran out of some mass, something like that. But they're determined to return when cleared. After this, I'm going to stand in a pace, this virus. I'm not going to be vulnerable anymore. Chris Reason, 7 News. A major stoush is brewing in the coalition with the Liberals and Nationals at war over the Eden Monero by-election. Let's go live to our state political reporter Alex Hart with those exclusive details. Alex, good evening. So what's triggered this political fight? Michael, it was a decision from the Liberal Party today to officially contest this by-election. Deputy Premier John Barillaro was hoping he'd get a 
clean run as the coalition candidate representing the Nationals. Now he faces the prospect of running against either Liberal Senator Jim Molan or his State Cabinet colleague Andrew Constance and he's believed to be very unimpressed. Minister Constance had indicated he wouldn't run against Mr Barilaro if Mr Barilaro nominated. But it's my understanding if internal polling is favourable for Mr Constance, he may just throw his hat in the ring, effectively forcing or trying to force his mate, the Deputy Premier, to back out of the race. This will test friendships. It could get very ugly. And, of course, the only party to benefit, Michael, is Labor. All right. Alex Hart at State Parliament. Thank you. Scott Morrison has slapped down suggestions made by mining magnate Andrew Forrest, who claimed the coronavirus may not have originated in China. The PM says the only, he only takes advice from experts in their field. I don't think anybody's in any fantasy land about where it started. It started in China. And, and what the world over um, needs to know, and there's a lot of support for this, is that how did it start? Um, mm. And what are the lessons that can be learned? The United States has backed Australia's call for an inquiry. The rocky road toward the start of the NRL season continues with no guarantee the Warriors will be allowed into Australia this weekend to start training. One hurdle, though, has been overcome with players agreeing to a pay deal. Hotel Warrior in country New South Wales. This is where the New Zealand team intends to recommence season 2020, Tamworth. There's just one problem. They're still not allowed there. Permission for the squad to fly in on Sunday is yet to be granted. That authority has not been provided. That will be made on the basis of the border assessments of the, the Australian Border Force and they're working through that application. They're expected to be given the green light but might have to push back their arrival into next week. We're just waiting and um, you know, hopefully the Warriors can be on the plane on Sunday. The NRL is still yet to sign off on the deal with broadcasters as negotiations continue over the bottom line. In some good news for the game today, the Rugby League Players Association and the NRL have reached an agreement on pay. Moving forward, the players will receive 80% of their wage. We've received uh, much more information today, which provided players with a, uh, a greater level of comfort. Players are really excited about getting back. And today, the Queensland government has agreed to allow players to play and train in its state, meaning teams from elsewhere can fly in, then out. Some steps forward ahead of the planned May 28 resumption. Peter Fegan, 7 News. In extraordinary scenes, armed protesters stormed a state government building in the US today, demanding an end to lockdown laws. Legally carrying weapons, they watched on as politicians voted on a proposed extension, arguing they've lost freedom and now 30 million jobs. Mutiny in Michigan. Armed with flags and guns, protesters storm their state capitol building. demanding access as leaders debated extending the emergency lockdown. Police blocked the entry, but eventually angry voters made it in, standing in the gallery with rifles as members below, some wearing bulletproof vests, voted against keeping people at home any longer. Their president says he's seen the evidence of where this crisis began inside a Wuhan lab. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. We should have the answer to that in the not-too-distant future, and that will determine a lot how I feel about China. In New York, they're focused on containing the horror still unfolding. Unrefrigerated trucks containing 60 or more bodies found outside a Brooklyn funeral home after neighbours complained about a foul smell. People loading bodies on it constantly all day. It's a shame. These are people's family members. This truly awful discovery here, a sign of the strain on New York's funeral homes right now, with more than 17,000 lives lost to the coronavirus in the city. Some places say they've seen more demand in the last month than they normally get in a year. Why on earth did they not uh, either alert the state the, who regulate them or go to their NYPD, do something? An investigation underway, but no charges have been laid. In New York, Paul Karak, 7 News. Two child killers who claimed allegiance to Islamic State were today sentenced as adults for their terrible crimes, including the murder of a service station attendant. The pair, who cannot be identified, were not in court as they were both jailed, one for more than 35 years. 
Zishan Akbar died just before midnight, stabbed to death at the Caltech service station in Queenbian, where he worked. His goal was to get the house to bring his sick mother and sick father. As the 29-year-old lay bleeding to death, his 16-year-old attacker scrawled on the window the letters IS for Islamic State in his blood. It was 2017. He and his 15-year-old accomplice, both of whom cannot be named, next hailed down a car. The driver was stabbed in the chest. The pair finally pleaded guilty last September. Now 18 and 19, they were today sentenced in the Supreme Court. The 18-year-old to 18 years and four months jail, the 19-year-old to 35 years, six months jail. I'm satisfied that the offender's schizophrenic condition contributed to the commission of these, these offences in a material way. That reduces his moral culpability and also reduces the need for general deterrence. The younger of the two will be eligible for parole in 2031. His partner will spend many more years behind bars. The court heard the 19-year-old hopes to finish his Year 12 education. He will be eligible for parole in 2044, when he will be 43 years old. His victim would have been 56 years old. Brian Seymour, 7 News. It was a dramatic morning on Sydney Harbour with a yacht raided by Border Force officers who climbed aboard, then searched the crew for drugs. The training exercise taking place as more eyes turn to the water, with air travel now almost at a standstill. A rigid inflatable boat speeding across the harbour might catch your attention. When it's a boarding party, it certainly does. The yacht was bigger, but border force outplayed it. It looks like the real thing, as officers pulled alongside the yacht off Bradley's head, then streamed onto it. They talk to people on board, search them, and it's done. Boarding a moving vessel can be tricky, even in the relative calm of Sydney Harbour, but out on the ocean, where the swell is significantly larger, it might be dark and your target might not be compliant, it takes practice. There's a lot of critical uh, elements that we need to, uh, to think about, and safety is one of them, obviously our safety for the officers involved. We have responsibility for certain threats, you know, not only narcotics through the border, but there's weapons, um, illegal entry. Last month, New South Wales Marine Area Command boarded a yacht 200 kilometres off the coast, seizing more than 600 kilograms of ice. The ocean is becoming the preferred route for massive drug importations from South America and Mexico, including Australia's biggest seizure, one and a half tonnes. It's essential training, and even in these difficult times, because uh, certainly the, uh, the crooks and, and the drug smugglers don't stop. Robert Ovadia, 7 News. Sally Bowery joins us now. Good evening, Sally. We certainly got a preview of winter today. Yes, it was pretty fresh today with the windshield factor making it feel well below the May average. Now, snow continued to fall across Perisher with a thick layer settling in across the resort. By the end of the weekend, we will have seen half a metre of fresh snow there. Tonight, snow flurries are also possible across the tops of the Blue Mountains and it's all thanks to a very cold air mass that's just lingering across New South Wales following that cold front. The blue in this map indicates temperatures below 10 degrees into this evening. Now, the wind chill factor today it meant it felt even cooler than the mercury, which itself struggled to get beyond the mid-teens today. Right now it is 14 degrees in our west, 4 degrees at Katoomba, but it feels more like minus 6. I'll tell you when the weather will warm up with the seven-day forecast a little later, Michael. Terrific, Sally. Thank you. Well, bizarre and frightening. A truck seen pushing a car down a busy freeway this morning. The story behind those incredible scenes next. Two men shot as they sat in a parked car in Maryland's police still hunting the attackers. Over the edge, the shocking moment a motorbike rider is sent flying. Later, the Aussie businesses forced into a COVID rethink now set to boom as restrictions are eased. And soon in sport, the NRL makes huge inroads in their quest to restart the season. A terrified driver's been pushed into a wild ride stuck sideways on the front of a moving truck. Stunned witnesses tell 7 News it went on for a kilometre and appeared the truck he didn't know what was happening. I don't think he knows. F***ing hell. Inside this car is a woman what trapped and screaming. It's on the freeway. I hear that and I'm not worried about it. 
beeping the horn in terror as other horrified drivers sound theirs. The truck driver appears to have no idea he's pushing a small car at 80 kilometres an hour. It was quite a big truck and it was quite high and it was a little, little, um, little car and it may have been, you know, right underneath his, his bonnet. So I don't believe that, yeah, he saw what was going on. The truckie only slowing down when the car in front flashed its hazard lights. Quite scary, especially to see it's 7 o'clock in the morning. The driver posted an emotional message on social media saying, I was travelling in the left lane minding my own business when the truck veered into my lane and clipped my front quarter panel and spun me in front of him. Clearly shaken, Kelly Bubeck went on. I was hanging onto my steering wheel hard left and accelerating so the truck did not pull me under. Reflecting on how lucky she feels to be alive. I was honking the horn trying to get someone to get him to stop. It was the most terrifying moment of my life. Incredibly, the driver of the car wasn't hurt. Police have now interviewed everyone involved in the crash and at this stage won't press any charges. I don't think he knows. Christy Mayer, 7 News. Border Force agents and detectives have stormed a Potts Point unit in a joint drug importation sting. Open the door! Police search warrant! Police search warrant! Police search warrant! There were several people inside where police say they also found drugs GBL and anabolic steroids. One man, a 42-year-old, was arrested, accused of importing drugs, then selling them across Sydney. Detectives say the drugs were found after mail and air cargo consignments from Hong Kong were intercepted. Two men have been shot on a Maryland street left covered in blood after a violent night in Sydney's west. The pair were sitting in a car when they were ambushed by two gunmen. They're now refusing to help police track down their attackers. Sprinting to safety, you'd never know Hassan Goktus had a bullet in his chest until you saw just how much blood he left behind. Emergency services racing to Badham Street in Maryland's last night when two men were shot. CCTV shows the moment their parked car is surrounded, a gun flashing in the darkness as they're ambushed. Seven eight shots, sound like a pistol just going off. After that, car's just flooring it. The getaway car, a light-coloured SUV, took off at speed. It had cased the home minutes earlier. Goctus made it about a block before collapsing on the footpath. His friend escaped with a gunshot wound to the arm. Slowly dying, you can see him, moving his legs left to right. I want to assure members of the community that this is not a random incident that police strongly believe that this is a targeted attack. Goctus is well known to police. He's been shot before in Auburn when he was just 16. His father also attacked the week before. Police aren't getting much cooperation from the victims at this stage, although they are confident someone will be able to help them track the shooters down. They say violence in residential areas like this is unacceptable. Give us that tip-off that we need in the early stages because this is certainly a callous and brazen attack. Andrew Denny, 7 News. Donald Trump has given more cryptic messaging about the health of Kim Jong-un. When asked directly if the North Korean leader is alive or dead, this is how the US president responded. Well, I understand what's going on, and uh, I just can't talk about Kim Jong-un right now. I just hope everything is going to be fine. But I do, I do understand the situation very well. Kim Jong-un last appeared on April 12, his absence leading to speculation that reported heart surgery went badly. But sightings of his train and boats have fuelled theories that he's staying at a resort. A motorbike rider survived being catapulted over an off-ramp in spectacular fashion and a crash in Canada. Police say he was speeding, unlicensed and unregistered when he overtook a truck and slammed into the barrier, sending him flying over the edge. He was seriously injured, but we're told is recovering. A pea plater has struck a patrol car, prompting a police warning about dangerous drivers. Up next, the vision that proves less traffic does not mean safer roads. A big bank closing over 100 branches. How that will affect customers. That's next. Western Sydney overlooked, claimed the region is missing out on vital health funding. And tributes flow in an emotional farewell to officers killed in the line of duty. A man in his 50s has suffered a serious head injury after falling from a roof in Bankstown today. Multiple crews, including a specialist medical team, attended the scene where it's believed the man fell about five metres. 
He was taken to Liverpool Hospital in a critical condition. Police are worried about a growing trend on our roads, drivers travelling at excessive speeds during the coronavirus lockdown. Double demerit points have not been ruled out as police warned they're out, for, out in force rather, to catch speeding drivers wanting to take advantage of quiet streets. Flying along King George's Road, her motorbike rider is locked in Polair's sights. The limit is 60, but he's clocked at 247. The road is not a racetrack. The rider is refused bail to front court next week, allegedly the latest in a worrying trend. Coronavirus lockdown has cleared the roads, traffic down by up to 55%, creating ideal conditions for hot-headed hoons. Looking at the last six weeks, police have seen an alarming spike. 425 drivers booked for speeding 45 kilometres over the limit, a staggering increase of 40% on the previous two years. Police will use whatever resources we have uh, to, to target and take action. They hope that having more police on the roads will help get the message across, but the government concedes if that doesn't work, they will need to consider more stringent methods, like having double demerits for the duration of coronavirus. There'll be no obviously increase uh, in, in penalties just yet. We're always open to, uh, to responding to spikes. Drivers are not only putting themselves at risk. Last night a four-wheel drive smashed into a parked patrol car in the Blue Mountains. Two officers inside escaped with minor injuries. Evan Batten, 7 News. More than 100 Commonwealth bank branches will close their doors for about six months as the lockdown forces people to avoid branches and do their banking from home. 500 staff will be redeployed to online services and call centres to cope with an increased digital demand. Other major banks have also temporarily closed dozens of branches. Boris Johnson says a menu of options to lift the lockdown and kickstart Britain's economy will be laid out next week. The government's now supporting the use of face masks being worn throughout Europe, where 63% of global coronavirus deaths have been recorded. Exactly one month since a sick Boris Johnson stood in the doorway, Downing Street's recovered resident returned. The new dad applauding health workers after chairing a cabinet meeting and fronting his first press conference. And I'm sorry not to have been part of this trio uh, for so long. Confirming the UK is past the peak of the outbreak despite recording more than 6,000 new cases in a day with a death toll set to be Europe's worst. We've come under what could have been a vast peak as though we've been going through some huge alpine tunnel and we can now see the sunlight and the the pasture but still in lockdown boris johnson will reveal a roadmap next week detailing how and when restrictions will be lifted but dates he says depends on the data with fears the economic damage from a second wave of the virus would be even worse in many European countries, face masks are a key part of exit strategies. Now mandatory on public transport in Austria, the Czech Republic, Belgium and Germany. The British PM believes they'll be useful once people return to work. The Russian Prime Minister won't be doing that for a while after testing positive, revealing his results to Vladimir Putin during a televised video conference. In London, Sarah Greenolch, 7 News. There's some disturbing new information tonight about who gets what when it comes to health. A big gap has been exposed as part of an inquiry which has found more cash is spent depending on where you live. And tonight we can show you where the money doesn't go. In Western Sydney, hospitals are getting bigger, like construction at Campbelltown Hospital, due to be completed in three years. So you can keep building hospitals and keep building new beds all the time, but you can't fix hospital problems by looking at hospitals alone. Figures to a parliamentary inquiry reveal a wide health funding gap in Western Sydney. These statistics show that there is a serious underfunding for health services right across Western Sydney. It's inequitable. Each person in the Sydney 
local health district is budgeted $2,500. In the Western Sydney Health District, it's $800 less. The same for the southeastern, southwestern and the northern Sydney areas. The Central Coast and Nepean Blue Mountains get more. But it's in the West, doctors say, who have greater health challenges. So there is actually a strong argument that we should be spending more in areas which need it rather than less. The state government says there's record spending in its health budget, but it's up to health officials to decide how and where that money's allocated based on the location of specialised services. We are intent on making it more equitable, but at the moment the services are where they have developed and that's where the doctors are. Changing in time, he says, as populations grow. Chris Maher, 7 News. A breakthrough medicine that can dramatically lower cholesterol levels, reducing the risk of heart attack and stroke, is being made more widely available on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Up to 30,000 more Australians will now have subsidised access to Repatha, saving thousands of dollars a year. Drugs to help people with severe asthma and rheumatoid arthritis are also being added to the PBS. All Victorian police stood in silence today to farewell two of their own killed in the Eastern Freeway tragedy. The first funeral was for Constable Glenn Humphreys, who'd only graduated from the police academy in March. Grieving officers joined his partner and family from the New South Wales Central Coast. Two hours later, the funeral for senior constable Kevin King. Another silent tribute from his colleagues after coronavirus restrictions limited the number allowed at those funerals. The coronavirus has forced many local businesses to shift their focus after the break. The new boom taking off as restrictions begin to ease. Property market shock, how the COVID crisis is impacting house prices. Out for a walk. One pet owner's essential exercise for her slithery friends. And I'll tell you how long Sydney's cold snap will last. The seven-day forecast soon. Let's have a look at the markets now. The ASX 200 finished the week in the red, closing down 276 points. All sectors posted hefty losses, led by major mining, energy and banking stocks. Fisher & Paykel bucked the trend, though, gaining 5%. Our dollar is buying 64.45 US cents. The fuel prices are lifting slightly in Sydney. The average rising to 93.1. We did find regular unleaded as cheap as 78.4. That was at Sydenham. After weeks in hibernation, Apple is set to begin reopening stores across the country. CEO Tim Cook made the announcement indicating Australia would be among the first locations to restart retail operations within the next two weeks. Apple closed all retail stores outside of China back in March to help curb the spread of COVID-19. The Starlight Children's Foundation, which aims to brighten the lives of sick kids, is hoping to raise $250,000 to keep helping families in their darkest days. Australians are being urged to make a donation during the annual fundraiser. The Foundation is still delivering vital programs to kids in need during the coronavirus crisis through virtual play sessions, interactive live streams and daily emails. On the road out of the crisis, New South Wales industry has stepped up answering the call to fight COVID and help keep the state in business. Almost 2,000 companies have signed up to the program to help save jobs and lives. When COVID-19 forced work to slow down for Carbon 8, the design and production company took a problem and turned it into potential. It just made sense. We have the machinery to do it, um, we have the staff and we have the time. So let's, let's put ourselves to work. Quickly identifying shortages overseas and swapping creative printing for personal protection equipment. I never would have thought we'd be uh, producing PPE and supplying the medical space, definitely not. We've got 25 staff or so um, and additional casuals brought in. They're one of more than 1,800 businesses who have answered the government's call to arms and signed up to the COVID-19 emergency supplies portal, repurposing their technologies and providing urgently needed medical supplies. Oh, we would have had severe shortages. Century Medical now provides tens of thousands of Carbon AIDS protective shields directly to New South Wales Health. So I was really surprised when he said, look, we can retool, re re redesign our entire workshop and design the products that you need. And I said, that's great. 
The government is looking for even more businesses to lend a hand and join the emergency supplies portal to ensure our frontline healthcare workers continue to have access to this critical protective equipment. This has been a real opportunity for us to see what local industry is capable of. Those interested in offering their services or seeking a supplier can register on the New South Wales government's website. Amber Laidler, 7 News. Now, this is not for everyone, but a Queensland woman has found an unusual way to beat boredom in isolation. Every day, Janet Hedges takes her six pet pythons for a walk along her driveway. She says she wouldn't be able to cope in lockdown without her beloved snakes. You have to follow me. You yeah, don't need leashes or anything. I just follow you. Couldn't keep one on anyway. Janet says her neighbours who share the driveway apparently don't mind. Well, despite dire predictions, Sydney's property market is remaining relatively steady during the crisis, but the lockdown has had a surprising effect on the rental market. Don't miss that story soon here on 7 News. First, Jim Wilson's here with Sport. Jim, good evening to you. Good day, Michael. Huge steps taken today in the NRL's quest to restart the season. Yes, Michael, good evening to you. Evening, everyone. Coming up, we're live with the latest on the Warriors, who remain grounded in Auckland, but there are major developments. Details next. While the Queensland Government gives the green light to clubs to train and play in the state while a pay deal has been struck. And what a turnaround. From a train wreck two years ago, our men's cricketers back on top of the world. Welcome back, everyone. There's been significant progress made today for the NRL and its plans to restart the season on May 28. A new pay deal has been struck with players. Queensland has opened its borders for games to be played there, but the Warriors remain grounded in New Zealand. It's been a week of tense negotiations, but today some major breakthroughs. A new pay deal that will see players earn 80% of their salaries. Relief for the man driving the restart at head office. Communication is cooperation and I think there was just a little bit of miscommunication and misunderstanding and once they had all the information, the players were more than happy. Players have already started the process of learning the strict biosecurity measures they'll need to adhere to from next week. Players are committed to, to get back on the field, they want to provide for the community um, and they just wanted to correct the narrative that was out there because it, it, it wasn't a pay dispute, there was no player revolt uh, and players are really excited about getting back. And a major victory for the NRL and Queensland teams this afternoon. The state government says they've relaxed border controls and games can proceed from May 28. And the Broncos, Titans and Cowboys will be able to train at their home venues. But players are firmly on notice. The Premier in Queensland has asked that you know, all our players abide by it, one slip up and, and that approval can be withdrawn. So the responsibility really is now with our players. Now the NRL has to convince the Victorian government to follow their New South Wales and Queensland counterparts and allow games in Melbourne and for the Storm to train there. Let's go live to our Chief League reporter Michelle Bishop at League Central tonight. Michelle, good evening to you. What is the latest with the Warriors? Good evening, Jim. I've just spoken to senior NRL and Warriors officials and they remain confident that everything will go to plan and they will be given the green light in coming days. Of course, they have already been given permission for an aircraft to touch down in Australia on Sunday. At, uh, that'll, that'll, that'll be happening in the afternoon. Uh, they just need the green light from border control to tick off on the players being allowed to be on board that plane. Of course, they, they'll be quarantined. Their base will be at Tamworth. Just fingers crossed they get that government approval. Jim. Hopefully that happens in the next 24 to 48 hours for the Warriors. Thank you very much to Michelle Bishop live there at League Central. Australia is the number one team in test cricket again. They've ended India's four and a half year reign on top in the rebirth led by Tim Payne and Justin Langer. I love our players. I'm really proud of what they've done and I know Australians are really proud of them and they like the team again. But it's a long way from mission accomplished. We have to beat India uh, in India and we've got to beat them when they come back. Australia is also number one in T20s for the first time leading into October's Home World Cup and Tim Payne will join me on Weekend Sunrise tomorrow morning. The NFL's newest Aussie giant has revealed the moment that started an incredible journey to the Philadelphia Eagles. 200 centimetre, 125 kilo Matt Leo was working on the Adelaide Oval footbridge as an apprentice plumber when he and his boss realised he was in the wrong job. We were crawling through this little passage and 
you know, I turned to him and said, man, I'm, uh, I'm too big to be doing this. Too big for rugby league. He went to the US, went through college and now joins Sydney giant Jordan Mulata at the Eagles. Fantastic story. Well, sports shutdown has created an enviable dilemma for one of our hottest rising stars. Golfer Grace Kim was due to create Aussie history at the famous Augusta course in the US. Then she turned professional. But then, now, she has the big choice to make in her future. Because golf's still allowed, we get to see the amazing Grace do her thing. Dad's the golfer in the family, you know, he, he got me out there and it was boring at the start, but look where I am now. 19, on the verge of superstardom, Grace Kim's just earned her third Kari Webb scholarship. Really what we love about Gracie is her appetite to get better. It includes a week as Kari's shadow at a major, last year, Hannah Green's Women's PGA Championship. I want to be like her when I grow up, so she's a big role model. This year was mapped out like a dream for the Youth Olympics gold medalist. Be the first Aussie to play Augusta Nationals Women's Amateur, the new Masters curtain raiser, then launch at the LPGA Tour. Heartbreaking because it was a big deal. Um, you know, it was a, like a big milestone for me this year. The choice now, turn pro or the once in a lifetime chance to compete at Augusta next year. A big win either way. Having that mindset of um, that you're going to be ready when things start to kick back, you know, that really gets me going. Adam Scott's due back at Augusta in November. We all want the opportunity to go and play the Masters, no matter when it is. Today, it was Mullaney Golf Club in the Sunshine Coast hinterland, nine holes with old mate Wayne Persky, live on Instagram. A new foray into social media, but he's cautious about the PGA Tour's mid-June resumption. For the people who are doing it really tough, um, you know, let's pitch in and, and we'll get there. Matt Carmichael, 7 News. Tell you what, Michael, great app for the Milani Golf Club yeah. and they were playing for the prize money of $5. There you go. All right, Jim, <laughs> okay. thank you. OK. Sydney properties are holding their values despite the freefall in interest rates sparked by coronavirus. The same cannot be said for rentals, with growing vacancy rates giving tenants increasing power to seek a discount. Just days ago, buyers had abandoned apartment blocks in Bondi, the epicentre of Sydney's property pandemic. Bondi, Bondi Junction, Waverley area became the heart of the coronavirus at some point. Now, things have bounced. People have come back, buyers have come back. Call Logic data out today, reassuring homeowners house values are holding their ground despite a crash in sales. Transaction volumes are down about 40% over the month and are actually at their lowest level since 1990. Tenants reaping discounts on rent, units in Sylvania slashed by an average of more than 12% to $500. In Roselle to $600, 11% cheaper. Rent for houses in Freshwater and Rydalmere down more than 9%. At this stage we can see that the power is with the tenant, not with the landlord. Uh, it's something that I've never seen happen before. Even Airbnbs are on the lookout for long-term renters. And in Western Sydney, where apartment towers are still going up, we're seeing the highest concentration of empty rentals in the country. Units here also attracting the least interest online. The places we will see a decline in value are anywhere where there are lots and lots of rental properties. But all signs say any downturn will be brief. Serena Andaloro, 7 News. Well, Sally's back now. And Sal, the weather, is it going to warm up this weekend? <laughs> well, Michael, things should start to cheer up with warmer temperatures returning soon. I'll have the forecast next. Tonight's 7 News headlines. Households around the state are enjoying their first night of relaxed social restrictions. The PM promises more will follow soon. A coalition stoush is brewing over the Eden Monero by-election and NRL players have agreed to a 20% pay cut, but the Warriors remain grounded. Now, here's Sally with the weather. Well, we had a taste of winter today, but the weather is set to warm up over the weekend with sunny skies on the agenda. Today we reached a top of 16.9 degrees after a low of 10 degrees this morning. Across Sydney suburbs, we saw tops of 16 degrees at Fairfield and Blacktown and just a chilly 6 degrees in the mountains at Katoomba. Now, we've seen a series of cold fronts just rip through the southeast of the country. That's triggered all the rain and the alpine snow and also those cool, brisk southwesterly winds. Those southerlies will trigger some more showers in parts of the southeast for tomorrow and also some alpine snow. The rest of the country, though, should be mostly sunny thanks to a high-pressure system. 
Around the capital cities, tops of 24 degrees expected tomorrow in Brisbane, just 10 degrees in Canberra with a shower or two expected, 13 the top of the lot for Melbourne, and it will be sunny with a top of 27 degrees in Perth. Let's take a closer look across the state. Temperatures will stay well below zero at Threadbow tomorrow, minus three degrees, a 19 at Batemans Bay, and a warmer 21 degrees at Port Macquarie with mostly sunny skies. Across Sydney's suburbs, it will be chilly in the wind. We can expect temperatures just to hover around the 18 degree mark along the coast, a little bit warmer in the west, Penrith heading for a top of 19 degrees. Now we are being warned to brace for severe weather across the state tonight, including for the snowy mountains, Wollongong, Canberra and Newcastle, with damaging winds gusting up to 120 k's an hour into tomorrow. On the water, seas will sit around the two metre mark, while Sydney's forecast is for a top of 19 degrees, with windy weather forecast dropping down to 12 tonight. The seven day outlook, the weather will start to warm up on Sunday, 20 degrees, should drop Back a bit just a touch on Monday. Slight chance of a shower on Tuesday, warming up to 25 degrees on Thursday before reaching tops of 26 on Friday. So, Michael, we haven't seen the last of the warm weather just yet. All right, fair enough. Sally, thank you for that. That is 7 News for this Friday. We'll have updates for you throughout the evening. The latest tonight is from 10.30. I'm Michael Asher from all the team here. Thank you so much for your company. Have a terrific Friday night.